I was in my early thirties, first time I met Ovid. He's a strange old duck, tough to tell his age. His face was deeply warm, and he had a fading handsomeness, peering hauntingly out from below a, a mane of thick white hair. His eyes were bright with intelligence and alive with wisdom. They missed nothing, and from the sadness buried in their depths, he may have seen too much. I liked Ovid from the start. He was Métis, had an Ojibwe mother, French-Canadian father, and hailed from some small northern reserve with a name I could never pronounce, a place only accessible by bush playing canoe or winter road. He was learned in the traditions of the Anishanbe, holding to values that predate Europeans. The old man could speak Ojibwe, French, English, and a little bit of Oji Cree. He told wonderful tales of his days as a guide for the rich American tourists. He'd fought fires and planted pine trees in summer, but trapping, that was his greatest love. He was the gentlest man I'd ever known, true elder. If I brought Ovid some tobacco, he would always tell a story, if I was patient enough to wait. Yep, you ask Ovid a question, and he answered with a story in the tradition of all the great Ojibwe teachers. Ovid was cutting pulp halfway up the Dryden Highway with a bunch of crazy Frenchmen when I met him. He'd been a drinker once, but Charlie Chabot, the camp cook, said that the old geezer could still outwork a man at twenty. But he was lonely in this camp. His workmates whispered behind his back about him having done time at Penetang. Nobody would bunk with him on account of his nightmares. Just hearing his screams every night gave him the willies. Fifteen years ago, I was making a living of sorts fixing propane equipment when the phone rang. Border Propane Services, Jake here. Hello, Jake. This is Charlie Chabot up at the Levine work site. Oh, hey, Charlie. How are things up at uh, Hillbilly Haven? Uh, cold, man, and me. You still fixing the propane furnace? Yeah. You having some problems up there? I see. Hey, you got a pig on that furnace or a couple of hundred pounders? Is a pig. We're good till the cold snap, eh? What do you think it is? Well, a pretty good idea what's wrong. I bet your boss didn't fork out the extra bucks for the two-stage regulator, did he? That's old man Levine we're talking about here. When can you get up there? Well, I can come up, uh, well, say after five? We're ten miles past Pritcher Creek now. So the camp's about two hours up the highway now. You guys keep moving further north on me. Well, have coffee on for seven. This is going to cost your boss big time. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'll see you when I get there. Now, the 502 is a nasty little highway. I hate driving it. Steep grades, tricky switchbacks, and narrow shoulders. It was snowing hard that night. Big, sticky flakes that fill in a road in minutes and create whiteouts in seconds. I detested going out in that stuff, especially since my service truck needed new tires. It was dark by 5. January, no moon dark. I gathered my resolve and... Headed out of my cozy office. Oh, there goes nothing. I oh, I owe soft to work. I hate this job sometimes. I wish I'd fix that radio. I drove for hours through that storm. The snow was sweeping across the road in sheets, swirling and transforming into hideous ethereal creatures dancing mockingly past the windshield as the lights burned sickly yellow cones into the gloom. By the time I reached the campsite, the road had all but disappeared. Deep and crisp and even... Man, this weather's going to be fun to drive home through. Can't tell where the road stops and the ditches start. Everything's white. Well, better find Charlie. I grabbed my stuff and tramped off through the drifts to find the cook. Ah, I see you make it after all, Jake. That's the trainer down there. Thanks for coming. Yeah, sure. I tell your boss it's time and a half tonight and mileage. Took my life into my hands coming out in this blizzard. That served the bugger right. I told him that regulator she was too small. I found the pig, changed the rag, then waded through the drifts to the door. Oh, hi, Ovid. Comment ça va? You bunking here alone? Hey, Jake. Yeah, all them young wusses won't stay here. Say I keep them up at night. <laughs> and it works for me. I'm not used to having company anyhow, especially those kids and their goofy music. Oh, yeah, and I bet they just love hearing your powwow music tapes all the time. Heartbeat of the grandfathers, Jake. <laughs> Besides, I have that old-time fiddle music, too. Oh, wonderful. Oh, hey, 
I bought you a pouch of pipe tobacco. So don't try rolling your own with that stuff. Kill you if you try and smoke it like that. You which, Jake? I'll share some with the Atsukawan, the night spirits. I went over and relit Ovid's heater, and in minutes the trailer was nearly back up to room temperature. I'm making some tea for us. Great. I could use a cup before heading home. You're having supper with me. I should be heading back. You know, the sooner the better. The roads are filling in pretty fast. Ovid turned, looked at the door, cocking his head to one side, listening, then shook his head. Can't let you go out there tonight, Jake. Yeah, but I gotta get home. I mean, the wife, she worries. Call her. You can't go out there. Not tonight. Something in his voice made me realize he'd given more of an order than an invite. Why not, Ovid? This isn't exactly the first snowstorm I've been caught out in, you know. Call your woman, Jake. You're not going back out there tonight. Here's your tea. Thanks. Well, maybe. Ooh, ooh, hot. Tea's good. Merci beaucoup. Charlie, close that door, you old fool. Get out of the cold. Don't think you're going back to town tonight, Jake. Radio, she says it's a bad storm. Big winter storm watch. You call your wife, no? Tell her you stay overnight? If you can stand, bunking in with that crazy old Indian thing. I looked out the door and saw the track to the highway had already disappeared under the snow. Well, maybe I'll take you up on that offer, guys. My tires are crap. Probably couldn't even get onto the highway without spinning out, let alone getting up Crow Rock Hill. Can I use your office phone, Charlie? Be my guest, Jake. Ain't fit for man or beast out there tonight. We trekked across the short gap between trailers, following Charlie's drifted-in prints that he'd made only two minutes before. I made my call. The wife actually sounded relieved when I told her. I was asking her to put a note on the shop door come morning when the line went dead. Line just went dead, Charlie. Now I'm marooned for sure. Lines go down in the middle of storms all the time in this part of the world. But something about that particular event made my flesh crawl. Suddenly I felt unreasonably happy the camp was powered by generator. A storm could knock the lines down, but so long as the gen kept purring, we'd be safe. Then a stray thought passed through my mind unbidden. Safe from what? Thanks for the use of the phone, Charlie. I, I'm off to Ovid's to bunk down. Good night. Bonsoir, Jake. I stepped out. The wind hit me like I'd smacked into a wall. The warmth seemed to drain from my body in a heartbeat, and I felt disoriented in, in a single step. I was only about a dozen feet to the door of Ovid's trailer, yet I was filled with a dread I hadn't experienced since I was a child awakening from the night terrors. My mind recoiled at the phantasmal swirling mass of snow buried by that wind. Get a grip, Jack. You're just tight. Then, out of the gloom came this shadow. Oh, bless his heart. For some strange reason, came out into the cold to shepherd me back to his trailer like some ancient St. Bernard, rescuing someone lost in the Alps. I couldn't understand what was happening. My, my mind felt like it had been turned inside out. I weathered lots of storms before, real bad storms. The blizzard of 64 took four days just to clear the streets. Tonight, everything just felt wrong. Unnatural wrong. We covered those few short feet of open ground in 20 seconds flat, but it felt like hours. Despite my insulated coveralls and military-style snowpacks, I was instantly chilled to the bone. My feet were like blocks of ice. Where we entered the trailer, it was as if something had sucked the light out of the room, and a thick gloom settled over us. What were you doing out there, Ovid? Putting down tobacco. How come? Ovid was silent for a bit. Then he said, Let's just say for good luck. Soon as he put down the tobacco, the room seemed to brighten a little. Then we discovered our mugs of tea had gone stone cold in the few moments I had gone to the phone. Ice crystals were forming on the surface, as a matter of fact. What the... Ovid, this is nuts. What's going on? You don't want to know, Jake. You wouldn't understand. Hey, I'm not some kid, Ovid. Come on, come on, get it. It was then that Ovid began to tell me his story. You know I did time, eh? The penitent? Yeah, I... I heard. Why? You know about penitent? Of course. It's, uh... It's a pen for psychos, the criminally insane. Oh, but you're no nutcase, Ovid. Uh, are you? Judge thought so. You tell me. I swallowed hard. This strange, gentle old man didn't have a bad bone in his body. I'd have bet my life on it. 
that's when it dawned on me that maybe I just had. You know I love the bush, eh? Yeah. I'd spend every winter alone on my trap line. But one winter I gave it up for good. Lost my appetite for trapping after that. Couldn't take the solitude no more? He waved his hand dismissively, saying crossly, Ah, uh, listen, you wanted the truth? I nodded. When I was about 25, my cousin, my brother-in-law, and me decided to combine our trap lines together. A co-op line. We had five trap lines. Between the three of us, we were going to make a killing. I discovered later that he did brother-in-law and brought a couple bottles of booze with him. Had a rule, no booze on the line. I mean, things could go wrong. Stupid fool thought he knew better. Yeah. Some people never learn it. Everything went real good most of the winter. I had the cabin near full with Brian Beaver. I hadn't seen so many high-grade mink and Martin pelts in years. They are flying high. And Ralph, my brother-in-law, he cracked open that booze to celebrate our success. I think that offended the spirits. And it isn't smart to offend the spirits. I wouldn't drink. Went to bed, but the other two killed one bottle right quick. Started on the next. And one of them knocked over the lantern and set the cabin on fire. By the time I woke up, it's too late. We would had time to drag those two drunks out before the roof caved in. Brother-in-law got his feet burned real bad. Lost everything but the clothes on our backs. Good thing we were dressed warm. We lost the pelts, the supplies, the cabin. Even the dogs ran. We were left with one rifle, three shells, and a sled. Oh, man, you were up the creek. How far away from help were you? Oh, four or five days at a fast walk. It was clear and cold. The moon made it near bright as day. Old Ralph, moaning and crying with pain on that sled about five miles till we came to one of our emergency caches. Found a tent, extra clothes. No, but an animal had got into the pemmican, so there was no food. Found two shells for the rifle, three boxes of 30 x six cartridges. Problem was the rifle it was a 30 30. But the battered coffee can we found the shells in gave him heavy. Sometimes the spirits like to tease you. Something about the way he said it that made me shudder. Took a while to set up the tent and get Ralph as comfortable as we could. Hands didn't work so well in that kind of cold. Lucky there were a few blankets wrapped in the tent. By dawn, we got the fire going and took stock. Ralph was in a bad way. But if we could shoot a rabbit, a partridge, or with any luck a deer, then maybe we'd all scrape through. With a couple of hours sleep, we broke camp and began hauling Ralph out. He'd whimper if we hit a rough spot. Mostly he slept. And some spruce need tea in for him. His feet were turning black. First they were burned and they had froze. He woke a bad fever by nightfall. We were all getting weaker by the hour. Two nights later, Ralph quietly went to the grandfather's. Uh, I'm sorry, Ellie. Long time ago, sir. The wind suddenly shook the trailer like a dog shakes a dead rat, and the light again trickled away. Ovid pulled out a small, beautifully carved pipe and silently filled it with the tobacco I'd brought him. He smoked a long time, turning the stem to each of the four compass points, lifting it to the sky and the earth, then handed it to me. The bowl was pipe stone, carved in the traditional Ojibwe style, the stem hand shaped wood of some kind. I took a polite puff or two, then handed it back. You didn't know you were a pipe carrier. You think something's wrong with the generator? The lights keep dimming down. A lot you don't know, Jake. It ain't the generator. That's right. That night the storm hit. Not your usual blizzard. This one raced in, and for only the second time in my life, I heard what I want to believe was thunder in the dead of winter. Big, oily, black clouds cut the afternoon short. Wind came up all of a sudden, making the canvas tent crack like gunfire. It felt like the wind was going to rip the tent from right out of the ground. Clouds twisted, boiled, or got too dark to see them. The campfire began hissing, sending sparks skittering across the snow. I'm sure glad the wind was blowing away from the tent. At least it wouldn't catch fire. The wind seemed to suck all the heat from the flames as they guttered like a cheap candle. Lashed the body to the sled before hunkering down to wait out the storm. By the time we finished, the snow was being driven by the wind parallel to the ground. It was like that wind was coming from every direction at once. We held together, wrapped in the blankets. We were in a world without warmth, 
without natural light uh, for the first time in my life I wondered if I was going to survive this we're starving three days no food the wind whipped the tent this way and then that the canvas shuddered and billowed the guy ropes groaned pitifully as they took the strain I kept expecting the ropes to snap and the wind to send that bit of shelter swirling off into the night the tent rattled like a living thing the storm went on Snow piled up on the windward side of the tent, bulging the canvas in against our backs. It must have been 9, 3 a.m. of the sixth day when the storm broke. The wind died in less than a minute. It was like something had switched it off. Silence seemed to shout out at us. It wasn't so much quiet as a complete absence of sound, as if the world were cowering in fear of being noticed. All I could hear was my own breathing. And our hunger was like a living thing. Fumbled a few ties open on the tent flaps and slipped my head out. The sky was crazy with stars. The moon hung low on the horizon, creating long, dark shadows on the newly fallen snow. I remember thinking that, for the first time in weeks, the wolves weren't calling to each other. It was a deathly silence. Then the temperature began to plummet. Must have hit minus 40 within the space of 20 minutes. A tree snapped with a frost. Silence sounded like rifle shots. Each time a tree cracked, we jumped. I glanced around the fired lungs, since buried. My eyes were slowly drawn to the shapeless lump that was the remains of my brother-in-law. The sled was blown over. In the few seconds, I needed to survey the damage to the camp. I felt the condensation from my breath cover my beard with hoarfrost. I pulled my head back in inside the tent fast. We dozed fitfully, too miserable with cold and hunger to sleep. Cursed the spirits that had destroyed our cabin. That may have been a mistake. We needed the spare candles just to have something in our guts to slow the gnawing hunger. Cousin had taken his boots off and began chewing on his buckskin boot laces. He, he looked gaunt, pitiful. I roused sometime later to the sound of something testing the canvas. My first thought was food. My next thought was wolves. But in a few seconds, I knew it was an egg and the wolf. Oh, it was way bigger. The moon cast a shadow of something huge on the tent wall. Hoping to maybe get lucky and shoot into a deer or moose. I slowly brought the rifle to bear on the middle of that shadow and fired my precious bolt. Perfect little hole appeared in the tent wall. That was the only effect it had. The scratching stopped as our ears rang with the report of the rifle. The smell of gunpowder filled the tent. Cousin looked out and saw nothing. Not even a print in the snow. He looked scared. I was scared, so we decided to wait until light to check further. I tried to sleep. We came back again, gently exploring the canvas. My cousin, his voice full of panic, began yelling at it to, to leave us alone. Go away. Ovid rose quietly and prepared more tea, then pulled some bannock from the oven, setting both on the table that separated us. Before we ate, Ovid placed a few bits of food in a small birch bark dish and set it aside. He poured more tea, then continued his tale. Then my cousin did something strange. He began rubbing his feet, muttered something about chill bites. He moved his feet, rubbing them harder and harder. He started to whimper, my feet, my feet, oh, they're burning, they're burning. Over and over again he cried. Sound slowly rising to a wail of panic. He had an awful look on his face. He yelped and hollered and began stamping his feet on the floor of the tent. He then let out a ghastly moan, ripped open the tent flap, and plunged outside without his boots before I could grab hold of him. I'll never forget the look of abject horror on his face, but I could scarcely recognize him. He twirled and danced just out of reach, screaming, Hot! 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 would have been comical, except such a sense of dread had come over me. Ovid carefully placed the mug of tea to his lips, took a quiet sip, then continued. He began running over the snowdrifts, light as a feather, howling like a banshee. In seconds he had disappeared into the thick bush. The nameless dread I felt told me not to try to follow him, and I believe listening to my inner voice saved my life crawled back into the tent and cried for despair, hunger, for helplessness. 
Several times I heard something dreadful scrabbling out in the snow that night. I couldn't look out of the tent for fear of what I might see. As dawn finally broke, the dread slowly lifted, leaving the dregs of terror deep in my soul. I was too weak. I was weak as a baby by now. I was determined to follow my cousin's trail for a ways. He'd been worse off than me. I couldn't have gotten far. Maybe he fell and needed help. I followed his shallow footprints, sinking past my knees in the snow with every step. His prints were normal at first, but soon they became strange. Farther apart with each stride, till they were six feet apart and more. Something beside the prints were another set of hideously big ones matching his stride step for step. My blood ran cold. Weird, unearthly prints. Horrible witness of what had passed by in the night. The prints traveled together for a bit, and then my cousin's prints vanished. Strange prints were all that remained for another dozen monstrous strides before they, too, just disappeared. I couldn't make any sense out of what had happened. The last few footprints were over 45 feet apart. Scared and bewildered, I retreated back to the tent, clutching the rifle and some willow bark back to make tea. Later that morning, I discovered that something had dug up Ralph's body from under the snowdrifts and carried it off. Two days later, another trapper followed me, still huddled in the tent, raving about monsters. He got me back home and it took me months to get my strength back. I told my story to my family. Nobody believed me. I couldn't blame them. I wasn't sure I believed it anymore, so I quit telling it. Maybe the hunger had driven me a little crazy. People looked at me strange the rest of the winter. It was then that Ovid took out an abalone shell bowl, placed a clump of his medicine in it, and lit it, smothering the flame so it just smoldered. The room filled with an aroma that reminded me of Thanksgiving. He placed his hands in the smoke as if he were washing with it, then offered the bowl to me. I declined. He smiled kindly, then set it aside, saying, It's only sage, one of the sacred plants given by the Creator. I shuddered in spite of myself when he said that. In the spring, the Mounties paid me a visit, asked me a bunch of questions. Seems they found the frozen body of my brother-in-law over 20 miles from the camp. His legs gnawed off at the knees. Tess said it wasn't done by any animal that they knew of. They never found my cousin, ever. I had no rational answers for what had happened out there, so I was arrested. And the Crown Attorney convinced some white judge I had gone crazy and killed them both, maybe ate them, without any real proof. I just got sent to jail for four years. I had to talk with a doctor who didn't believe me either. With that comment... He wrinkled up his nose as if a skunk had just settled in his lap. When I got out of the pen, all I could think of was what had happened that night. I started drinking to shut it out. I nearly killed myself. The booze. All the time I kept drifting farther south into Minnesota. One day I met this old elder and told him my story. He said the Windigo got my cousin. Gave him tobacco. And he explained that it was a spirit creature that resides in the North Woods in winter. Sometimes hunts, inhabits men, driving them crazy, causing them to eat human flesh. He gave me a little medicine bag and warned me that the Windigo never gives up the hunt once it gets your scent. He told me to always call on Mabuse, the rabbit, for help in winter. To never go out in the bush if I didn't hear him singing at night. Kept drinking and drifting for seven years. So one day I was working in a logging camp south of Rainy Lake and met a shantyman. A what of it? Oh, one of them traveling preachers that used to visit the winter logging camps in the old days. He helped me some. Talked his ear off. He listened and never once judged me. He got me into A before he left the camp. He checked on me every time he came through the area after that. One day he stopped coming. Later on, I heard he was killed by a drunk he was trying to help. There was something different about that man. Ovid shook his head as if to free himself from the memory. That was the only time I ever saw him tear up in all the years I knew him. Eventually, I headed back up north again, and here I am. What made you decide to tell me this story tonight, Ovid? You trying to scare me? Ovid had refilled his pipe and was quietly smoking it. It had sort of drifted off into another world I knew I would never share. He roused at my question. My people have this tradition. The elders tell stories and legends only during the winter, though. 
One story we learned about as a kid was how Abusa the rabbit became the guardian of the land during the winter. It seemed that the creator had given the job of looking after the forest to Makwa the bear. Uh, but you know, Makwa, he sleeps all winter. So the animals got together to decide who would be the caretaker of Mother Earth. Well, Makwa sleeps. Winter can get pretty miserable. Uh, nobody really wanted the job. Uh, Fox and the wolf both refused since they were too busy hunting and everyone else was too busy trying not to become their supper. Old man Sturgeon couldn't do it, trapped under the ice. The eagle doesn't want to die. So finally, crafty Wabash, the fox, used flattery to convince Wabush the rabbit to take the job. So on winter nights, you can hear him singing with his high-pitched whistle. A song telling everyone all is well. Now, Abus isn't the sharpest knife in the drawer, but he has a keen sense of self-preservation. So when Wendigo walks the force, wily Mr. Abus isn't sticking his neck out for a job he really didn't want, and he refuses to sing. Then Ovid smiled a ghastly smile and said, Last night, before this storm hit, Abus stopped singing. 